Hi, my name is Callum Waldron Hall and I'm a poet who lives in Liverpool. I'm really excited and grateful today to be reading with the Saboteur Awards on behalf of the New Poets Prize. I'm going to be reading to you from my collection Learning to Be Very Soft. It's out the 1st of June with the Poetry Business, alongside some other really great books from Abby, Ben and Jay. I hope you enjoy. I think I'm going to start with the first poem in the pamphlet because that seems to make sense. So. This is called Chest Compressions. By the pool again, one boy is pretending he isn't breathing, that his heart has stopped. So his friend leans down, exhales what he believes is life into the wet cave of the other's mouth. Then linking his fingers simulates a steady heartbeat but not so much as to crack the ribs imagines his friend coughing out water the way he'd shudder and when they are both dry neither will think of the past hour as practice how oddly rehearsed and familiar until perhaps years later in his room, one boy will remember how he lay in precise stillness, inches from the edge of the pool, holding his breath, not daring to move, not daring to break character. I used to be a lifeguard, so I've always kind of been around water. Um, it kind of plays a key role in this. Um, so this poem is kind of how the characters throughout this pamphlet are introduced to the water. Um, it is called Sister Arrives After the Floods. Sister has come to stay for the week. She says the floods in her town got too bad, found their way inside her house and ruined her favourite sofa. Sister says next time she will remember to draw her curtains more tightly. She says she has never seen rain come down the way it did against her roof that there was so much she had to leave behind her best comb her sharpest scissors sister says without her scissors how will she ever be productive again as soon as she arrives she heads to my kitchen and turns on the cold tap says the water here is nothing like the river street at home. She tells me to watch as the sink fills up and spills over the lip, drenching her shoes. Sister says, even here the water can reach her. It always will. Yet look how easy she can make it stop. This sister character kind of makes quite a few appearances throughout this pamphlet. It's kind of trying to explore this sense of second self, I guess. So the next poem in here is called Careful, and it's after a Karen Soli poem called Lucky. To be careful is the condition of sisters, for the tucked in bedsheets and loose hairs. Sister, your room is made from parts of me, and in places, the piling of our clothes in heaps. A mother who moves through mountains of girl is groundbreaking. A pioneer among those avoiding hard work. You will not be remembered for leaving the house and stepping into a new life. You must be accepting of this, though you wouldn't think twice about sleeping on sofas. And if you can name one person who cares for you 
who is not quite a sister, then imagine yourself being missed. You may have to dig out the skirts you took from me when your own clothes stay so new, your new house so clean, still ruin everything you can. No one will tidy. Sister, you're moving out is like a landslide. You are devastating, tied to so little. Your absence, I've been struggling to stand. This next poem is called Celadon. I never stop to think if there are others like me. Cupping the newfound weight of themselves and discovering more than they thought possible. I remember being told the name of a place that seemed impossible to reach, but I'm sure I visited once when I was younger, too overwhelmed to have named it. A steady feeling of excess, of something pulling down. I spend a deal of time searching for clues. Celadon, don't you see how it is both hard and soft? The closest match is Epididymocyst. This is a temporary name. Something without a face is approaching. I'm taken out of school for an entire day. We're heading to Leicester. A jumbling of letters. Lucy eats ice cream every Saturday tea time except on rainy days. Lucy can be lurgy a lump, a lull. I'm remembering more of the city. When I visited, everything was green and filled with flowers. A man with nowhere to be was peering intently through a frosted glass window. The room is painted for children. I'm developing a fascination with Celadon. It rolls around my mouth like a marble. Every time I'm reminded of it, it feels like I'm standing at great height. As the day stretches, a stubborn tree springs back to life and must be cut down. This happens very often. The second time I visit, everything is more vibrant, detailed. It's extremely easy to pretend everything is fine, that everything is still how it used to be. The city roughly maintains its shape. The one house has moved an entire 11 feet to the right, and I'm exactly two inches taller. A woman is waiting, standing on artificial grass. She's repeating a complex phrase under her breath. A man that talks of my body with indifference. He gestures with his blue-green hands. I'm not sure if there's a word for impossible place. How strange to talk about it, as if it belongs to me. To see yourself twice is a great gift. Okay, this is a poem about the same sisters from earlier. I think there's always something quite fatalistic about somebody be so close to you in that it's inevitable that one day you're not going to have that again. Um, which sounds quite sad, doesn't it? That's what I'm trying to explore in this poem. So this is Sister Leaves Home During Our Favourite Show. You told me you were leaving while we were watching TV. The screen arguing with itself, bleaching the shadows in the room turquoise. I was staring hard at your shoulders as you forced your life into a backpack too small. We'd been watching a repeat of our favourite show, making our way through season two, waiting for our favourite character. We knew which scene came next. The acrobat, the martial artist, the best friend. We knew how fast she would move between people, how precise she'd be. 
striking the most tender parts of each body, how quickly they'd give up and soften at her touch. You were folding clothes when she appeared, and when I tried to stop you, filling the space between us with my clumsiness, hoping each hit might hold a part of you back. You didn't flinch, but you were hurting in some unusual way, and then you and your bag were gone, leaving me rolling my wrist and resenting the acrobat. How she could be so impossibly exact. How I already knew how the season ended, but still let the TV play on. We started this with some water imagery, so we're gonna sort of end it around a pool as well, I guess. I seem to write a lot about swimming pools. They kind of just invade every sense. You can almost taste the chlorine when you go in. The sounds sort of just carry across the room and never really seem to end. There's always a weird kind of heat. Yeah. Um, this is called, but this was never about the swimmers. I am followed by an unshakable feeling that I should have noticed your hands hesitating when you unhooked the ropes at the pool, rolled everything in. How typical of them, heavy with water, to fall from the rusted wheel, and you without a word, unwinding and starting the process all over. How typical of those lonely swimmers, who think if they push their bodies between the ropes off lanes, they might just once be surprised at what can happen when we go beyond what we think we can do. After their aching muscles have finished, sobbing at the side, drawing in great breaths, and you, hunched over, head between your knees, wondering how many times would you have to loop the ropes back before everything was in its place.